All right, and off we go. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this morning's webinar on employment and social innovation in the EU. My name is Emily Nelson. I'm a European Programs Officer at The Wheel, and I will be moderating today's session. So a very warm welcome to all of our speakers and attendees. Um, delighted to have such a great turnout today. And before we get started, I'm going to quickly run through some basic Zoom housekeeping items. So we are in a Zoom webinar now, and if you're looking for your camera and your microphone, please note that attendees do not have access to these, so you can sit back and relax and focus on the presentation. If you would like to communicate with us, please pop any questions that you have for the speakers into the Q&A box. So that's the one with the two speech bubbles on your toolbar. And the speakers will answer those questions throughout today's session. If they don't get to them today, our follow-up email will include their contact details so you can get in touch with them directly. If you have any issues with Zoom, please pop those into the chat box and my colleague Christina and I will do our best to help you out. In the chat box, you can also feel free to say hello and where you're joining us from today. So we are recording today's session and we'll send a link to the recording to everybody who's registered for the event um, in the follow-up email. And we'll also share the slides and any other resources that are mentioned. All right, so that's the housekeeping done. So now let's just take a look at the agenda. Okay, so this event is the official launch of the EU's Employment and Social Innovation um, or EASY funding program in Ireland. And we are delighted to be the first ever Irish national contact point for the EASY program. So aside from introducing you to the EASY program, the aim of today's event is really to introduce you to a wide range of other initiatives supporting employment and social innovation here in Ireland and across the EU. So I'm very happy to be joined by an excellent group of guest speakers uh, to talk to you about their projects and their programs. Uh, so the event is very much an awareness raising exercise and hopefully you'll hear some things that pique your interest. We have quite a full agenda today, as you can see. So again, just put those questions for the speakers into the Q&A function and we'll do our best to get to them throughout the day. If you are tweeting about today's event, you can feel free to use hashtag Irish Easy and tag our Twitter account. Um, and I think my colleague Christina will pop those into the chat for you. So yeah, now onto the agenda. So first we're going to hear from our keynote speaker, Jose Blanca Zieste from the European Commission's Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. Then it's over to Rachel Barrett from the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science for an overview of the European Social Fund Plus. Then Katrina Matangasa from Business in the Community of Ireland is going to present a case study on their EPIC program so that we can see what the European Social Fund Plus looks like in action. And then it's back over to me for an overview of the wheel services as Irish National Contact Point for Easy um, and just highlighting some upcoming funding opportunities. Lisa Fenwick from Disability Federation Ireland will put what I've said into context by giving a case study on their Easy funded Unique project. We'll have a comfort break as we'll probably need it at that point. And then we will hear from Mario Botero from Rethink Ireland on Ireland's National Competence Centre for Social Innovation. And last but not least, Jean Gilmore from the Department of Social Protection is going to walk us through the EURES program. So I'm delighted to now turn over the virtual floor to our keynote speaker, Jose Blanca Zieste, who is the EASY team leader for the Commission's DG for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. So it's over to you, Jose. Hello, everyone. So I will share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Yep. Okay, then we can start. So, um, Jose, I think it's in uh, presenter mode. So, so you just want to, to change it so that. Um, Does it move? Yeah, it moves. Okay. Okay, that's fine. We'll go. So, hello, everyone. Let's start on this. So I will uh, introduce the ESF Plus as a whole, but more specifically, I will enter into the details of the easy strand of the ESF Plus. So first of all, uh, the employment and social affairs at political level, uh, it's a shared competence between the EU and the member states, but the, the responsibility primarily remains with the member states to uh, implemented locally to um, um, establish regulation or laws to uh, uh, just uh, implement uh, the policy of employment and social affairs. And then the role of the EU is more to support and complement whatever the member states are doing. 
Um, and it implies, for example, um, taking incentive measures or adopting directives that then are implemented into uh, national laws, but also to coordinate and monitor national policies and to implement EU law, to promote the sharing of best practices and to provide funding instruments. And in these funding instruments, we have mainly the European Social Fund Plus. So in the period 1420, we had the, the European Social Fund, the Youth, Youth uh, Employment Initiative, the Fund uh, of European Aid to the Most Deprived, and we had the, the Employment and Social Innovation Program. Now, in this period, 2127, um, we have streamlined the regulations. We all the, the four funds are under the same regulation, which is the European Social Fund Plus. Um, and to notice that, in fact, uh, the ESF, the FEAD, and and the Youth European Initiative are uh, shared competencies. In fact, it's funds that are delegated to the member state to be implemented locally. And then EASY, it's a program that is directly implemented by the Commission. It is an important distinction because if you have a project, and before entering into um, more detail, but the, the main difference is that if you have a project that is uh, purely lo local, um, you will not address easy. You will address the ESF plus, the FEAD of the Youth Employment Initiative. On the contrary, if your project is a project where you need the cooperation with uh, entities of other member states, then you you might enter into easy because then uh, you enter into what we name the EU added value, where, where we seek the cooperation between entities between uh, different member states. Now, the European Social Fund Plus is the EU uh, fa main financial instrument for a more, more social Europe. Um, it has, uh, in its Article 3, its general objectives, which, which are to achieve high, high employment levels, uh, to ensure a fair and social protection, uh, to uh, in, contribute to develop a skilled and resilient workfo workforce, but also to, to uh, help developing inclusive and uh, cohesive societies aiming to eradicate poverty. So that was for the main, um, the general um, objectives of the ESF Plus that are shared between all the strands. So these general objectives are there for the ESF Plus for the shared management, but also for the easy strand, which is the one where you uh, coordinate the activities of, um, between uh, entities of different member states. So uh, at the level of employment social innovation, the headline ambitions uh, of uh, the commission is to have an economy that works for people, a, a Europe that is fit for the digital age and a new push for European democracy. And the SF plus uh, contributes to these three objective uh, headline ambitions of the commission. This one is key. And then you have the uh, what is, um, well, the light in the tunnel for the employment and social innovation, which is the European pillar of social rights, um, which are 20 principles like equal opportunities, active support to employment, secure and adaptable employment wages, or mi minimum income, old age income and pensions. And um, it will be the main source of inspiration for the SF Plus, but also for EASY. Then we come to more concrete detail of the regulation and uh, what are the specific objectives that the SF Plus is uh, trying to attain. And you have three main uh, prior, prior, priority political areas. You have employment and labor mobility, education and social inclusions. Within employment and labor mobility, you have the specific objective of accessing employment, modernizing labor market, to, to, to reach a gender, to promote a gender balanced labor market and to promote healthy and uh, well adapted working environments. In education, you have quality and inclusive education and training, active inclusion and improving employability, lifelong learning, upskilling and reskilling, and equal access to and completion of quality education training. And last but not least, in the priority area of social inclusion, we have the integration of third country national, nationals marginalized communities and people at risk, but also the access to social services, such as social protection and healthcare and addressing material de de deprivation.
Now, entering into even more specific, we enter into the easy strand in the one um, that search for cooperation and uh, cross-border activities. So we have operational objectives. And what we want to achieve with EASY is to get comparative analytical knowledge on employment and, and social protection, but also to um, uh, ensure information sharing and mutual learning, support social experimentation, uh, to support the voluntary geographical mobility and this materializing URES that we, you will see at the end of the, of the webinar, to promote uh, the market ecosystem, uh, developing a market ecosystem and microfinancing, networking and dialogue, uh, to support social enterprises and investment, social infrastructure, um, to ensure transnational cooperation in, in the field of social innovation, and also to have develop international social and labor standards. And then we have four types of eligible activities into our work programs. So we the, the activities that are eligible under the, under the easy work programs are the analytical activities such as studies, surveys. Um, then we have uh, the support to policy implementation, the capacity building activities, and communication and dissemination. These are the types of activities that, that are eligible under the easy strand. So now we have two types of management modes, the direct management, where in fact it's act activities that are implemented directly by the commission or the indirect management where we delegate the, the budget to uh, a, a third party. In the direct management, we the, 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 the activities that we implement through the three priority areas of employment and labor mobility, education and social inclusion are either grants when we want to support activities implemented the, uh, through consortia or procurements when we want to acquire uh, studies or, or organize conferences and other act actions. And these actions, in fact, you will find them in the yearly work program. Um, the yearly work program, in fact, is presented every year to uh, the technical working group that is composed of uh, members of the ministries of each member state. And we also consult the EU level uh, stakeholders on, on the work program every year. So at the level of grants, in fact, we publish um, call for proposals. We publish six or seven call for proposals a year under EASY. And in fact, the Commission selects on a competitive basis since it's in fact call for proposals. Um, and we select organizations to implement projects under a co-financing scheme. And in fact, these projects contribute to uh, EU policy aims, in fact, to, um, to contribute to employment and social, social inclusion activities. Um, and in, in fact, a grant, it's a financial contribution by way of a donation that co co complements the funding that the beneficiary puts in itself on the, on the table. Then for the tenders, in fact, we aim to purchase goods, services, or works in, in exchange for a payment. Um, and it's an execution according to contractual uh, conditions. As I said before, we will, we will implement tenders when we want to acquire studies or reports or um, political analysis um, or legal analysis of regulations. Um, these are the kinds of things we acquire through uh, tenders or procurement. Then in the grants, we have two types of grants, the action grants, where we finance activities which aim to achieve uh, a part, uh, an objective part of it, our, our policies, or an operating grant where we finance our program or, of a body that pursues uh, a general European interest. And we have such activity, for example, with Caritas or other EU-level organizations. Then the overall budget of DSF Plus is 99.2 million euros for the, the seven year period. And for the specific strand um, of employment and social innovation, we, we have a budget of 762 million and on the direct and indirect management for the seven years.
will be noticed that we have a budget of two, nearly 200 million for the transnational cooperation for social innovation which in fact is a budget uh, that is allocated from uh, the shared management strand to promote in fact the um, the, the the upscaling of um, social innovation projects that were developed uh, under easy but not only under easy but to ensure the upscaling of social innovation projects within the member states in order that we replicate them at a, a higher level in easy we have tested um project of social uh, of social innovation during the seven previous year and here with this activity what we um, intend to do is to promote them uh, with intention to reach a higher level of implementation of this uh, social innovation solution. Now, um, and this is an, an example of, from the work program for 2023 on how we uh, we uh, break down the, the budget. So we, we, we have a, a yearly budget of approximately 101 million uh, a year. And um, in fact, it's broken down into seven, 57 million for grants, 32 million for procurements, and 5 million in other actions. And then the indirect management, which is uh, a contribution agreement. Uh, we have a contribution agreement with international organizations such as ILO or WHO or OECD. And there we have, depends on the years, but something like uh, four, five, six million. And the transnational cooperation. Um, that is delegated to an entity named ESFA, and that uh, we have a bud budget of approximately 30 to 35 million a year. And uh, what kind of actions do we implement under the transnational cooperation? In fact, uh, the transnational co the, the, the delegated entity ESFA organizes organizes uh, capacity building activities to enhance the capacity of administration in member states to implement social innovation projects, but they also publish call for proposal uh, to, um, to have uh, so, um, social innovation projects. Last year, the subject was, in fact, migration and integration of uh, migrants into uh, um, not the employment, the labor market, but not only the, the labor market, but also to uh, social services in the EU. And uh, this year will be, there was also the, the call for homelessness. So these are the objectives that we had for 2023 that more that in fact um, fit more or less with all the, the, the specific objectives of the work program. Um, I will conclude there because I, I have a lot of slides and I, I will <laughs> let out the other speak, speakers have the time to present present their own subject. Um, but as a conclusion, what I would like you to remain is the distinction between what is implemented at a local level. If I take a social innovation uh, project, for example, to uh, um, support migrants to access to social security services in, in, in a given region of Ireland, then it's purely the SF plus, the shared management uh, scheme, and it will uh, be channeled through uh, the Irish authorities. Now, if you are talking about, if this project was in uh, a cooperation between uh, Irish entities, French entities and Dutch entities, to uh, just discuss on how to implement a scheme to uh, help migrants access the labor market, the, then this fits under easy because there you have the added value, uh, the, um, the, the sharing of experiences that is promoted under the program and it's EU level. Uh, I hope this is clear. It's an important distinction between how to use um, what is uh, imp implemented di di directly uh, by the Irish authorities and what is implemented by the Commission, which is seeking a cooperation between ent entities of uh, several member states. Um, and last but not least, to conclude, I would like to thank Emily from the NCP who have invited me. And the NCP uh, in Ireland, the National Contact Point for Easy, is there to support you to, to help access our activities. I think Emily will enter into the detail of the call for proposal for Easy of this year. Uh, this is why I won't enter into detail, but any question you might have, you can channel it through the, the Irish NCP. Thanks a lot. I will sh stop sharing. Great. Thanks so much, Jose. Uh, thanks for, for not stealing my, my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a really great overview of just kind of 
the sort of European Social Fund Plus and then Easy and sort of the distinction between the two and just great to see kind of how much funding is out there in the EU, EU for organizations to access here in Ireland. Um, so if anybody has questions for Jose, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A um, and he can answer them um, via the chat. Um, and I will now pass it over to Rachel Barrett from the Department for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. I think I got all this. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay. So can everyone see that? Yep, perfect. Great. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, the Irish uh, National European Social Fund project. So when Jose kept talking about the Irish authorities, he was talking about uh, he was talking about us here in uh, in the department. So I'm going to be going through uh, what we do and how it fits in um, with Easy and other uh, parts of the program. So, so. The first slide here is about uh, an overview of ESF Plus. So uh, ESF is the main instrument for investing in people across Europe. So all of the programs they support, um, things that are gonna help with social inclusion, education, employability, that's what the program's all about. So I won't labor this point because uh, Jose talked about it quite a bit, but this, uh, this program of ESF Plus, the plus is indicating the merger of other schemes that were separate previously. So. Um, ESF Plus brought together ESF, uh, the Youth Employment Initiative, um, funding for the most deprived, and then EASY. So all of those things were brought in under the same umbrella and became ESF Plus. So as discussed, ESF, Youth Employment and uh, Funding for the Most Deprived are merged and became part of our national scheme. Our national scheme is called AISHT. I'll talk about that in a moment. So the first three are part of AISHT. EASY stands separately, so EASY comes in under an umbrella of ESF+, Plus, but it's not part of our Irish ESF scheme. So EASY is, is different, but is part of the same you know, umbrella of activities. So um, the ESF Plus programme is the Employment, Inclusion, Skills and Training, which we called AISHT, and that's our national programme for ESF+, Plus, uh, which runs from 2021 to 2027. So, AISHT has a total allocation of just over a billion euros. Uh, it's co-funded between uh, the national government and the EU. Um, so the national is uh, 532 million and the EU contribution is from the 509 million. So it's slightly more uh, on the national side. And then there's the funding we receive from the commission. So overall, it's a 1 billion euro program just over. Um, so it's very significant funding until 2027, uh, sorry, 20. So um, the way that AISHT, what AISHT is, how it runs is, um, is set out and is, uh, is regulated by two regulations. So there's the common provision regulation, which sets out how ESF plus has to be organized and managed and how we have to run it. And then the ESF regulation uh, sets out kind of the principles and the priorities of what, what ESF can fund. So that's what was used to develop our program and that's what kind of governs the, the running of it as we go forward. Um, we put in a proposal for what the Irish um, ESF program would look like uh, to the commission um, and that was approved last November for, so that based was approved at the commission level and then we started um, we, we started the program just actually in March. So, um, so the program was formally kicked off by the minister and we had our first monitoring committee um, in late March. So, um, Aisht in a nutshell uh, focuses on five main areas. So we have access to employment activation measures. So that's about um, helping people become more employable. Activation is about trying to um, encourage people who are considered inactive employment terms, so people like who are long-term unemployed, who've been out of the workforce for a long time, there's specific focus on those groups. Upskilling, reskilling, and promoting lifelong learning, um, that's what we felt fairly self-explanatory. Um, active inclusion and social integration is about trying to look at marginalized groups and how they can be brought in and included in society better. Social innovation, I know a lot of you all know what that is, and then food and basic material assistance for most deprived. So that's the successor to the old feed program. Um, so over the lifetime of age, so until 2027, uh, we, uh, we are targeting 
over 340,000 people. Um, so it's it's large when it comes to ESF, I guess, compared to maybe other European funding where you're, you know, building a road or building a bridge or doing a project. You know, Asia is about large numbers of people and really trying to get, you know, large numbers through different programs, different courses, um, and, and then following them to see what the output was. Um, Aish is obviously a national program, so we are supporting um, ranges of courses and schemes and projects across the whole country. So we work um, with the education and training boards. We work with agencies all over the country. Um, so every part of the country should um, should really feel the benefit of this program. And most of our funding um, is funded through other government departments and other government agencies. So we the way that Aish is delivered is we uh, we delivered. The programs directly through central government or agencies sometimes we do deliver, deliver it indirectly so another agency takes on some of the management of the program and they then work with other agencies or bodies to deliver that program most of the calls and most of the funding um within it, it it's non-competitive so it's been allocated so that there won't be calls in most cases but there will be a few um so i can talk about those now so this is the way that um, AISH kind of breaks down into who is doing what. So we have, uh, we have who's delivering it here, the other departments, the other agencies, and then kind of what, what they're delivering. So some of these you'll know, Jobs Plus is quite well known, Assistance the Most Deprived. So most of these you won't find that there'll be calls uh, that you can apply for, but there, are, there will be a few and you can find them mostly in this area of social innovation. So seeing who's here, I know that you probably, that will actually be of quite a lot of interest to you. So that one is being managed by the Department of Rural and Community Development, who are currently working on developing those calls at the moment. So when they are out and when they're live, um, they'll be, uh, just go backwards, they'll be advertised here on EU funds and the calls for proposals. So keep an eye on that. And we'll be, um, our comms team here will be using social media and other channels to advertise those. So that's a whistle stop of, Aish, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to see them in the chat. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thanks so much for that, Rachel. It's really good to kind of see all the different sort of strands and things that kind of Aish and ESF Plus is doing here in Ireland and kind of the opportunities that Irish civil society organizations can access through it. So thank you for that. Right. And now Katrina from Business in the Community Ireland is going to give us a case study of their ESF Plus funded program, um, EPIC. So over to you, Katrina. Thanks, Emily. And thanks, Jose and Rachel, for, for your overview. Um, you know, Jose has given us the really big picture. Rachel has given us the more Irish level picture. And I'm just going to be talking about what it's like, you know, being the, in receipt of the funding through, through the EU. So let me just, okay. So I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview of the EPIC program some background on our EU and government funding, because we've been part of that shared funding that Rachel was talking about. Um, our experience of the opportunities and challenges from receiving this kind of funding and some, some tips and recommendations just based on, on our experience. And I'm very happy to take questions either at the end of this or you can contact me separately. So, so the EPIC program, it falls into the area of social inclusion and uh, employment and integration of uh, marginalized groups, particularly migrants. So the whole point of our program is to support migrants who are living in Ireland and who are legally entitled to work to access employment, training or education. So obviously this is working with vulnerable migrants who are facing disadvantage. So the program started originally in 2007, so it's got a really long pedigree at this stage, and it's run continuously um, with support from EU, primarily ESF funding and with government funding. It was originally developed at the request of the Department of Justice and Equality um, to support migrant parents of Irish-born children uh, who had citizenship. This was in the wake of the uh, referendum which changed citizen rights, but, uh, meant that there were people living here who needed to integrate. But it was very rapidly expanded in 2008 to support a wider cohort of disadvantaged migrants. So that included third country nationals and EU migrants, um, many of whom would have come more from um, Eastern European countries at the time of accession then and who needed more support to find employment. So over time, the program has evolved a lot. 
um, and has been working with different cohorts of migrants over time. And what we have seen is that the migrants who come to Ireland, it really reflects the global geopolitical and economic situation. And you will see different groups of migrants over that time. Our current main work, and we're very focused on this, is people in the international protection system, so asylum seekers, and people from Ukraine who've been fleeing the war from the war there. And uh, so mostly the people will be working with people who've quite recently arrived in Ireland. And uh, for asylum seekers, they now have the right to work, but only after six months. So they will often be living in direct provision. So they're, they're scattered throughout the country. And um, the programme is managed and delivered by Business in the Community Ireland. And we have a team of 11 people, but it's 9.1 full-time equivalents. So it's quite a large team. Um, what the what participants receive is um, employability and integration training and is very tailored to the needs of the particular groups that we're working with. Since COVID, we moved our training online, which has been, it's, it's very much changed from uh, direct face-to-face -face delivery, but the big advantage is that we can now support people who are all around Ireland rather than just based in Dublin. So that's been a real strength, especially as so many uh, of the asylum seekers and people from Ukraine are living around the country. Um, apart from the training, everybody is supported individually by a career guidance counsellor, and that's both during the training and afterwards. They also get many supports from businesses, which, you know, IT training and other supports. We have small grants and IT equipment we can loan, we can loan to people. And we provide holistic service. So there's also psychosocial support as well as direct support about employment. Um, we work directly with companies and so uh, refer people directly to job opportunities and also support them to apply for jobs in the open market. And once they've started, we help them to transition into employment and to maintain that employment. So it's, it's a very holistic service. And just from 2008 to 2022, we've supported um, over 3,800 participants who've come from 101 countries. And the, just slightly less than half of those would have progressed to paid employment during the time that we were tracking them. And another a further 24% into training, education or internships. So given that we're working with very, a very disadvantaged and marginalized groups, so frequently I think these results are very good. So. In terms of funding, which is what we're, we're really talking about here, from 2007 to 2020, we were receiving ESF funding, which was managed by the Department of Justice and Equality. In 2020, that transferred, and you'll have seen on Rachel's slides that uh, it's now being, well, funding is being managed through the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. But in fact, a lot of the same people transferred from justice and equality, which when equality moved across to the, to the new department. So we're working primarily with the same people, but it has changed things as well. So we've been funded under a number of different ESF and now ESF plus programs. So from 2008 to 2016, it was the Human Capital Investment Operational Program with the not very great acronym of HISIOP. Um, but then at the end of that period, there was, well, I wrote requests for tender, but in fact, there was a call for proposals was issued um, for PEL, which was the Programme for Employability, Inclusion and Learning. So that we were very fortunate to get significant funding under that programme. And it ran, that funding ran from 2017 to 2020, in fact, just into 2021. And then there was, for various reasons, a lot to do with COVID. There was a kind of slowdown in the rollout of the next program, the AISHD program, Employment Inclusion Skills and Training Program. So that did leave a gap in funding. Again, we applied for funding under that and we did receive some funding. And um, so that's, uh, so so we've had continuous, continuous funding under that, but it just, that gap in funding is something to consider. So overall, our experience of being in receipt of funding through the ESF and Irish government has been very positive. Um, 
I think that there is no way that a program like, like the EPIC program could have been developed or delivered without that, this kind of funding. So it allowed that kind of support for disadvantaged migrants to enter the labour force in Ireland and to be supported in a very tailored way to do that. Being part of EU funding can, can, lead, can give you opportunities for profiling and uh, you know about speaking opportunities at EU events and, and other kinds of publicity and that can lead to other opportunities so it's, it's that's a really worthwhile uh, thing to take advantage of and um, in terms of working with our funders particularly who are the EU funds unit um, I think again that's been positive the application process for funding that was developed on the call for proposals I felt was very reasonable and uh, well organized and transparent in how it worked and the people that we work with directly um, are extremely helpful and supportive and, uh, you know, a pleasure to work with. And so it's, you know, that, that's always a help. Um, a thing to consider is about reporting, reporting requirements. As you're dealing with, with government and EU funds, there's a, quite a high level of reporting required, but there is good, good support to, to achieve the right level of, of reporting. Um, in terms of challenges, um, definitely a challenge for us was that we are we 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 are quite dependent on on a single source of funding, and so when there was a gap between the end of one fu one funding program and the start of the next, that was a very big problem for us, given that we had a large team and we had to maintain that. Um, Maintaining contacts in different government, de government departments, the transfer from, from justice to DCE DIY has, you know, th that has caused us some difficulties. So it's just important to, to work on maintaining contacts. Um, because again, because you're working with, you know, we've got a an implementing government department, which is now DCE DIY, then you've got the ESF managing authority, Rachel's department. And um, then above that, you've got uh, EU level as well. And what we found particularly for our Pell funding, because we had had a lot of a significant amount of funding under that, that we had a lot of auditing and uh, at, at multiple levels. So it's just to, to consider that. Um, reporting itself can be quite complex. There's, uh, you know, some detailed spreadsheets with lots of formulas and just keeping those up to date and getting them working properly um, can be a challenge. And um, also there's a requirement for quite long term retention of supporting documentation um, because you can be audited for quite a significant period of time after the funding has finished. So you just need to be aware of that. Um, let's see. So in terms of tips and recommendations, um, as I said, I found the application process, it's, it's fair, but it's, it's time consuming. So you need to give, give plenty of time for that kind of work and make sure to get the right people involved in putting together the proposal. Um, be realistic about what you can achieve and make sure that you can track the outcomes that you commit to, because you do have to report against everything that you said you were going to do. Um, as I mentioned, um, keep maintaining communications with your funding contacts is important. Obviously, over time, things can change and projects can be adjusted during the, during the funding period, but it's important to maintain that contact. I mean, for us, obviously, one of the biggest changes was, was uh, the COVID pandemic, and we had to make very significant changes to our project. And again, the funders were very supportive about that. Um, Reporting, and I keep mentioning reporting because it is an issue. Um, it's got it. It will be time consuming, and it's so important that you keep on top of your reporting and set up robust systems to make sure you're tracking everything that you have to report on, and you're able to do that in a very, uh, you know, you can prove what you what you're reporting. Um, given the uh, eight and uh, a lot of the ESF funding is about supporting people your projects are likely to have participants and it's really important to gather and record all the information that you'll need to report on in a timely way. If you want to go back later and try to contact people to get information, that can be really difficult. Um, okay, I already mentioned about retaining supporting records. 
um, because that is just something to consider. It can also involve a cost if you're, if you're storing paper records and then you have to retrieve them. And as I mentioned as well, just to be aware of becoming dependent on uh, EU and government funding, because it's not necessarily always going to be there. There may be gaps. You may not get the funding that you require. So you need to make plans for what will you do if this funding doesn't happen? You know, if your project like ours is a sort of an ongoing project um, rather than something discrete in time, you need to work out your contingency planning around that. So I think that's it for me. And if anybody wants to get in contact, I'm happy to be emailed and I'm sure Emily will be sharing contact details. So that's, that's it from my point of view. Thanks, Emily, and thanks for the invitation. Thanks so much, Katrina. It's a really great presentation. And it's really good, I think, for people to just kind of see what this sort of funding looks like in action and kind of like the impact that it can have on your beneficiaries and also just your staff in terms of kind of building their capacity to sort of manage these kinds of projects as well. So thanks for that. Thank you. OK, so now it is over to me, actually. Um, so I am going to do um, a bit of an overview about our supports um, as easy national contact point in Ireland um, and just kind of highlight an upcoming uh, funding opportunity through easy. Okay. Uh, so, as Jose mentioned, um, the Employment and Social Innovation, or EASY program, um, really aims to support employment, social policy, and labour mobility across the EU. Um, and as we learned, it's a strand of the European Social Fund Plus program, which Rachel covered um, in good detail. So, as part of ESF Plus, EASY follows the same policy objectives and uses the European pillar of social rights as its main framework. Um, and there are four specific priorities for EASY. And these are strengthening employment and skills, helping to improve social protection and inclusion, improving labor markets and ensuring fair labor mobility, and fostering safe and fair working conditions. Okay, so how will EASY actually advance those four priorities? So the program aims to do that by funding projects delivered by various target groups. Um, and so some of those target groups include civil society organizations, and by that, we mean nonprofits, community and voluntary organizations, social enterprises, academia. So some of the other target groups would be public administrations, social security institutions and employment services, microfinance institutions, and institutions that provide finance to social enterprises. So here I've listed the types of project activities that EASY will fund for these various target groups. So we've got analytical activities. So that means things like conducting surveys or studies or trying out new methodologies. Um, EASY also funds things like piloting social experimentations and innovative solutions. And those experimentations or solutions could be things like developing training modules or digital learning platforms or apps. So EASY also funds uh, networking and capacity building activities with peers across the EU. Um, EU-wide labor mobility schemes, and Jean will touch on this uh, during her ERES presentation. And EASY also funds communication and dissemination activities. Uh, so for example, exchanges of best practices and peer review. So those are the kinds of things that you can get funding for through EASY. So the way that EASY funding is accessed is through funding calls that are published throughout the year, as Jose demonstrated. And as the Irish National Contact Point for EASY, the WHEEL publishes all of these calls on our dedicated EASY website. And we also put, uh, publish them on the WHEEL's Access Europe program website. So I'll talk more about how you can stay up to date with EASY opportunities in a moment. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to give you kind of a flavor of the types of funding calls that have been published so far uh, this year and sort of what they mean in layman's terms. Uh, so we had a call for an implementation of a European tracking service for pensions. So that's exactly what it sounds like. So it was about improving access to pension information and improving pension awareness for workers. And then there were two calls for proposals for um, that had to do with posting of workers. So one was about activities to tackle undeclared work. And so that was really about supporting relevant organizations to develop initiatives to prevent and deter undeclared work. And then the other um, call for posting of workers was about enhancing 
administrative cooperation and access to information for posted workers. Uh, there was also a call for URES cross-border partnerships, and that was about facilitating workers' intra-EU labor mobility. And one that would probably be of particular interest to this uh, group or audience here was the call about uh, support to the European platform on combating homelessness. So that call was about promoting knowledge and capacity building activities um, that kind of supported the implementation of that platform. So the European platform on combating homelessness was launched back in 2021. So that call was about kind of uh, implementing the work program for, uh, for the platform, getting the word out there. So all of these calls were published on www.easyfund.ie. And on the website, you can sign up to join our mailing list. So you're kept informed about, uh, about new calls and events like this. So yeah, that's just a flavor of the types of funding calls that Easy offers. And as you can see, a lot of it is quite specific. So that's what we're here for, to kind of give you advice on what might be the right funding call for your organization and your activities. So now we've had a look back at previous funding calls. Um, let's have a look at an upcoming opportunity that may be of interest to folks here. So I think the remaining call to be published for 2023 uh, is a call for proposals for social innovation practices to combat homelessness. So the objective of this call is to support capacity building for governance structures or social experimentation for service delivery in the areas of homelessness and housing exclusion. And the call has a specific focus on kind of developing new forms of collaboration with public authorities to tackle these issues. So the funded activities uh, for this call will include piloting and evaluating innovative projects or policy measures, addressing homelessness and housing exclusion. And the activities can also include things like mutual learning, exchange of good practice with peers across the EU and awareness raising. So the budget is 50 million euro and that will be distributed amongst 15 selected projects. And so partnership is often a, a requirement for EU funded projects. And for this funding call, um, proposals by both single applicants and consortia are allowed. However, the project actions have to be implemented in at least three eligible countries across the EU. So if you don't have EU partners um, for your project, then you need to be an organization that has branches across the EU or is an EU-wide um, kind of network of members. So the planned publication date for this call is I think tentatively early September, and then the, the planned deadline would be mid-December. So if you're interested in applying, it's something to start considering now. So kind of putting together a project uh, concept. And again, that's something that we, the wheel as NCP for this program can help you out with. Uh, and once the call is published, all the details and the application link will be uh, on the EASY website. Um, but in the meantime, you can read more about the call in the 2023 um, EASY work program, which I've linked here. Okay, so now that you have had an overview and a look at some of the easy funding opportunities, where does the wheel come in? So as I've mentioned several times, <laughs> the wheel acts as the national contact point for easy in Ireland. And prior to the 2021 to 2027 EU budget period, the easy program didn't have national contact points. So this is a new feature for both the program and for the wheel, and we are very excited to be providing the service. Um, so some of the supports that we offer as national contact point include um, <clears throat> basic guidance on easy regulations. Um, we can provide assistance with finding those project partners that I mentioned. We can help with the development of your project idea and provide application review. Um, and then we also give updates on the calls for proposals and other easy program news. We'll also be hosting an in-person um, kind of easy event in fall, probably September or October, um, where hopefully we'll have a chance to kind of do breakout rooms so people can meet potential project partners and kind of talk about project ideas. So um, we essentially provide any kind of advice or info that you need for getting started with easy funding or managing it once you've successfully obtained it. Um, and in addition to these services on our website, we have a page for other resources including the annual easy work program that I mentioned earlier. There are some really good guides for social experimentation and social innovation that have been created by um, other civil society organizations that have been involved in easy projects. So it's kind of based on their learning. Um, so best practice tips. And we also have a whole range of project partner finding tips. 
Um, there's also a link to the uh, EASY and ESF Plus project results platform so you can see what other organizations have created um, and find inspiration for your own EASY project. Um, we are also hosting a training today um, on how to build an EU partnership at, at 2 p.m. So it's kind of a nice follow on from the event today. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot of you there. If you haven't already registered, there's still time to sign up. Um, and Christina will pop that link in the chat so you can sign up if you'd like to. And it's just a really good way to get um, a really in-depth info on a key characteristic of many uh, EU funded projects. So to avail of any of our NCP, National Contact Point Services, you can check out our website um, and sign up to that mailing list. You can give us a follow on Twitter for regular updates and funding call announcements, or you can reach out to me directly at easy at wheel.ie. Right, so that's it from me for now. So I think at this point, what we will do is take a 10 minute break if everyone's all right with that. Um, if we could just come back here at 11.35, um, and then we will continue on with the remaining presentations. And if in the meantime, you have any questions for the panelists, please do pop them into the Q&A. Okay, so thanks, and we will see you all back here at 11.35. Thank you.
Okay, so it's 1135. So welcome back, everybody. I actually don't have any sense of whether or not attendees have returned because I can't see you. Um, but I think we can move on to the next part of the session. I'm um, here. <laughs> hi, Jean. So, um, so we unfortunately had a cancellation last minute. So we don't have our easy uh, case study on hand. Um, but Jean is going to step up and do her presentation early. So Jean, are you comfortable uh, with sharing your screen, your slides? Oh, you're just on mute there, Jean. Yeah, there you it, go. Should be, it should be fine. Yeah, I just yeah. see how my setup is here. I'm not in my own office, so bear with okay. me. Take your time. <laughs> okay, so I'll just share the screen. Mm -hmm. Just tell me when you see it there. Yep, will do. Yep, I see that. Okay, I just have to go to the beginning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and just tell me then when it's all good. Yep, beautiful. Great, okay, so um, you can hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Great stuff. Okay, so really <clears throat> what I'm doing today is just giving you an overview of what URAIS is and the, the network of the employment services across Europe. So there you'll see by the color of the map, you have the 27 uh, EU countries, and then you also have countries like Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein and Norway, who are not in, in fact full members, but they're EEA members of, of URAs. So they're still very much an active countries uh, in, this, in the service. Um, so I'll keep this kind of brief because it's very wordy, but um, uh, it's a network of the European employment services. And sometimes you'll hear those referred to as PES, which is the public employment services. So for example, the Department of Social Protection when it's referred to within EU terms, it's called PES. So it's just to be aware of that, that um, the URA service is normally based in the PES in each country across Europe. It's not always in the PES, but more than likely it is, which is the equivalent of the Department of Social Protection. And as I mentioned there, we have the 27 EU member states uh, and the additional countries there. <clears throat> so it's really about uh, supporting labour mobility services, as we heard a little bit earlier on, um, and to facilitate the transnational cross-border mobility, which really affects main other parts of Europe more than ourselves, uh, because there are so many um, uh, workers who and employers who work cross-border across Europe. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the Euros network includes around 1,000 Euros advisors, and they work within the PES, the Public Employment Service. So their, their role is really to, uh, you know, give information to job seekers and employers. Uh, they uh, support people with relocation, placement and recruitment to benefit employers and job seekers needs. Um, the European Coordination Office, which is referred to as the ECO, is... is uh, is, called, is, is based in the European Labour Authority, which is ELA, and they're based in Bratislava. Um, so they coordinate the activities of URAs within, across the network. And then each country has an NCO, which was, is the National Coordination Office. And that's where I work with three of my colleagues. And then we have a group of URAs advisors out across the country. So this is uh, URAs. Uh, in numbers at a glance. So there's normally at any one time on the URA's uh, jobs portal, there would be around 3 million vacancies. Um, <clears throat> they're trying to build capacity very much around uh, all of the URA's member states uh, using the URA's jobs portal um, uh, much more regularly. And we also have a link straight in from Jobs Ireland. So once an employer put their jobs up on Jobs Ireland, they automatically transfer onto the URA's uh, jobs portal. So these are the kind of figures. Uh, there's 5,000 employers. Uh, people can load up their CVs um, and employers can look at their CVs. There's a matching capacity as well. And then we have the URA's advisors who link into that jobs portal. 
Uh, we also have members and partners, which I'll cover in a little uh, a little while, <clears throat> and their kind of uh, work with the URA's network. So members and partners across uh, the URA's network, uh, they're, they have 31 countries now taking part who have members and partners. So the key URA's channels really would be the uh, URA's job mobility portal, which I just mentioned. There's the link there. You can go in and you can go in as an employer, as a job seeker, you can register, you can just graze through the jobs. Um, and then you have a lot of information down here on the base that you can click into. Um, and then there's obviously videos there as well, YouTube videos that you can look at how to use the portal, both from a job seekers point of view, from a service providers point of view, and from an employer's point of view. Um, then, Another key part of our service would be running um, European online job days. Some of you may be familiar with this and may have been involved previously uh, with some of the online job days. Um, we organize them here in the NCO. Um, for Irish employers, uh, we've done a number of different events, which I'll just uh, tell you a little bit more about now in a second. So again, there's your link, the European job days .eu. Uh, so the service for employers <coughs> uh, from the jobs portal, they receive alerts for matching profiles, helps them to find candidates, uh, contact job seekers, advertise jobs and get hint, uh, hints and tips on contracts, on uh, job roles, on job specs and descriptions, etc. So uh, then we have the service for job seekers, uh, very straightforward, find a job, contact an employer. They can create a profile in a CV online. They can get job, job alerts. Uh, again, they can get contact directly with the Euros advisors. So for example, if someone in Ireland is looking to move to Germany and they know which area of Germany they want to relocate to, they can actually go into the portal and uh, search the area where they want to work or they're looking at relocating and they can get directly in contact with the Euros advisor in that region. Um, we also provide information on living and working abroad. That's a key part of what we deliver uh, for people who are relocating out to another EU country or people who are uh, coming to Ireland to work. There's also financial support for moving abroad through the Target Mobility Scheme. And we, uh, <coughs> we're uh, participants in that. So any, anybody coming to Ireland for the first time uh, to take up a position of a job, they will get a relocation uh, allo allocation fund. They also, there's a number of different funding that they can get. Um, so if anyone is more interested in that, I'm certainly happy to uh, go into more detail afterwards. So this is our own team. There's our own link that brings us you to your gov.ie site, which gives you a very comprehensive and easy way to click in and look at everything that we do in URA's Ireland. So these are our URA's advisors across the country, um, and they can be contacted uh, through the website as well. So they will go out and talk to employers. They will uh, link in with job seekers. Um, they'll do living and working presentations, and they would be key to our online uh, um, URA's jobs days as well. These are some of the jobs days we have done recently. Um, and I have built in the links here, so I will get this over to you, Emily, and we can, uh, you can send it out there because you can just actually go into the portal. Again, that will be on your link for eurasireland.ie. It'll have this link built into it there. Um, so we recently did one around construction, which obviously is a huge area where there are skill shortages. Um, and that was in cooperation with a number of countries. <clears throat> and then uh, towards the end of last year, we did an event with Spain uh, across um, all sectors. So um, again, I can go into more detail on those if anyone is particularly interested in finding out more or getting involved in one of our online job days. 
We also do on-site job days as well, by the way, uh, but they just haven't, they're, they're only starting to happen again in the last year. So we take employers out to Madrid or Seville. We've also had events in Granada. Um, and hopefully next year we'd be looking, this year we'd be looking at uh, Portugal, Spain, possibly Croatia as well um, to do events. Then we have um, an option um, within URA's Ireland for uh, members and partners. And that means working alongside with URA's Ireland to provide uh, the support services, um, you know, alongside uh, the URA's Ireland team. So basically that would be um, in other countries, it could be private social enterprise, it could be, uh, a local partnership or a local um, employment service network um, and what they can do is access all of the portals and services that uh, URAs um, <clears throat> provide. Again, it kind of is self-explanatory there and I can go into a little bit more detail. It's really, it would be uh, uh, you know, if, if there's anybody listening here who is interested in the URA's members and partners or becoming a URA's member and partners with URA's Ireland, they can contact me afterwards. Um, we also have publications there. So there would be uh, publications on the labour shortages and surpluses uh, across the URA's network, um, how to move and find a job um, online within, the, within Europe and uh, more information about um, working anywhere in Europe, which is called Search, Find and Match, um, again, through the European Employment Service Network. So I know I kind of flew through that a little bit, but uh, th there's also a link here, <coughs> which brings you directly into the Euros Ireland overview. I can play this video if I have time. You can just let me know. Yeah, go for it. OK. All right. So. Let's hope it works. <laughs> so we'll probably get a little YouTube thing up first. Okay, just bear with me for a sec. Any luck with that, Jean? I don't think we can see the video. Jean, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we can't see the video. Oh, you can't see the video. No, sorry it, about that. Can you hear it? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's okay. okay. We can just, All right. we'll circulate it in the follow up. Yeah, I think, I, think I probably easiest. had to go into the Google search and put it in that way. Sorry about that. I was yeah. watching it here. It's very good. <laughs> just enjoying yourself there. That's yeah, fine. exactly. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll just come out of this. <clears throat> so if I click myself out of everything, yeah, and I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. That's Sorry fine. about that. No, you're fine. That happens. Um, it's I was very happy. I thought, oh my goodness, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, it's, it'll be easier to just kind of share all those links yeah, in the and follow up. Yeah, there are lots of little links in there that will give a lot more information. You know, there's a yeah. lot to it. So I just uh, put in the links there, particularly about the online jobs day, members and partners and the general URA's Ireland. Yeah, no, well, that was brilliant. Thanks for that. And now okay. I feel much more educated about URA's myself as well. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks, Jean. 
Okay, and for our last uh, speaker, we have Mario Vitero from Rethink Ireland. Um, so Mario, the floor is yours when you're ready. Thanks, Emily. Uh, yeah. Just give me one second uh, because I'm running. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. Yeah, great. Hello. Um, good morning. We still, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Botero. I'm the impact director at Rethink Island. And I'm here to talk about the Fuse project with all of you. Um, I should be sharing my screen, Emily. Yeah. Yep, you can, you can share okay. it. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Just give me one second there. You can tell me if you can see this. You can see my screen right now. Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, great, excellent. So, well, um, as I was just saying, I'm here this morning to talk to you about the Fuse project. Okay. Uh, so, what is the Fuse project? First of all, okay. In in 2020, the European Commission uh, launched a call uh, with the aim of supporting the development of an establishment of national competence centers for social innovations across Europe, and um, Fuse is one of the six consortiums who were um, implemented, okay, um, with the support of the European uh, uh, Commission across Europe. So let's go a little bit about what were the key objectives of this call. So this call was aiming three key objectives. First is to have a transnational project, project who was enhancing uh, mutual learning across different member states. The second is the creation of a competence center for social innovation. And finally, is to activate and develop the social innovations ecosystems at national level, but also learning from each country. So the three key competences that um, or, bring, or functions that the European Commission uh, identified for these national competence centers was the first one, to mobilize the ecosystem, to empower the ecosystem and all the key partners and stakeholders that are working there. When we are talking about the ecosystem, we are talking about public entities, private entities, civil society and academia. The second, to allow transnational cooperation. And finally, to create collaborations and synergies. But let's go one step backwards. So first of all, what is social innovation? Okay, so social innovations refers to the development and implementation of new ideas, products, or services that address social problems or improve the well being of individuals, communities, or society as a whole. So, when we were endorsed by the Irish government uh, to represent Ireland in this European call together with Genio, another Irish organization, we formed this consortium that includes uh, organizations for four countries, Ireland, Portugal, Bulgaria, and Cyprus. As you can see here, from different organizations from all these countries. And the three key objectives of our um, consortium was first, okay, is to strengthen the social innovation ecosystem of these four countries, allowing transnational cooperations and learning from each other, Second, to identify and validate the needs and gaps in each social innovation ecosystem with the goal of establishing a sustainable and responsive national competence center for social innovation. And finally, allow transnational corporations and shared learnings. As you can see, the four countries, okay, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Cyprus, and Bulgaria, they have social innovation ecosystems that are at a different level of maturity. And the main idea also following um, uh, the, 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 the guidelines from the European Commission is to allow these transnational cooperations and learning from each other. So um, HORA is the Irish dimension of the FUSE project, okay? So it's all the actions that we have been implementing at Irish level, okay? And the four key activities that we have been implementing has been first, we did a mapping exercise. We did a snapshot. How is the social innovation ecosystem in Ireland? So we did uh, an external research that actually you can have access. It's in our website in the Fuse Project at EU. You can have access to the full research where we were assessing what are the gaps and needs and what are the strengths and weaknesses of the social innovation ecosystem in Ireland. 
Second, we were also during the whole process of these two years, it's a project that started in 2021 and it's going to be ending hopefully by the end of June, okay, this year, okay, we will be, we were also raising awareness and building the capacities and skills of all social innovation uh, players. Third, something that we have been working, especially during the last year, we have been developing a joint blueprint and a strategy and action plan for the full development of the social innovation ecosystem in Ireland. And we have been doing this uh, with a very inclusive and participatory approach, bringing organizations representing uh, public sector, private sector, civil society and academia together so we can be working in a collaborative way. And finally, uh, the, the final objective was to establish and develop a national competence center for social innovation. Something I want to highlight, and as you can see there in the diagram, that I think has been one of the key aspects of this project, as I was saying, is to have this ecosystem approach in the way of implementing, so working with all the key players in the sector. So from the beginning, we created what we call it an advisory consultative group, as you can see, organizations who are representing all the different sectors, uh, working in social innovation in Ireland, and also supported by our steering committee, where we're sitting two departments, the Department of Rural Community and Development, uh, who is in charge of social innovation in Ireland, and the Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovations and Science, where is sitting the managing authority um, uh, in charge of the European Social Fund. So we are almost at the end of this journey, okay? And what has been the learnings of these two years? From the research, it has been clearly identified that in Ireland, we have a fertile uh, ground for social innovations. There's a lot of initiatives and there's a lot of potential at the grassroots levels. Nevertheless, it is clear that there is a need to increase awareness and to build a common framework. What do we mean for social innovation? Further, we need to develop uh, and build the capacities of social innovation's key stakeholders, not only about social innovators itself, but also across all the different key stakeholders so we can allow more uh, strength collaboration across all of them. As we were talking, we need to develop structures to create gaps and silos between government departments. Um, something that was quite interesting um, when we were assessing the social innovation e e e ecosystem is the need of moving beyond cash grants, how we support social innovations to scale and maximize their impact, having access to different funding mechanisms and having an effective use of European funding, not only ESF, but more than that. Um, one key element also taken from another European country that was quite interesting is like the need of having this long-term vision, multi-annual investments to support the strategic development of the sector. And finally, how key can be the establishment of a national competence center for social innovation to catalyze and drive the development of the whole sector. Some common trends and challenges that has been identified at European level has been the first one, as I was also mentioning for Ireland, is to build a common social innovation framework. It is very important that we all understand what do we mean for social innovation so we can be moving together. The second one was about, as we were all saying, no, is about founding. So how we can be moving beyond grants, how we can look for other ways of financial social innovation in a sustainable manner. The third one is about developing capacity buildings for the social innovation ecosystem. Not only as I was saying, for the social innovators itself, so they can scale, but also inside uh, public sector, private sector, and academia, so we can allow higher interaction between them, okay, to develop the full sector. And finally, one key element is impact measurement and management. The importance of assessing and measuring the impact, the positive impact of the social innovations they're having in our society. So where we are at the moment, um, we have developed a blueprint um, that has been already shared with the government and it will be presenting probably in the next month, okay? It will be socialized. And this document is an action plan and a strategy to support and inform um, the development of a national policy for social innovation. 
So we were we have been identifying four key access and 12 actions that are key to further develop the social innovation ecosystems in the next five years. More than that, also following uh, other European experiences, a key element that we see it will be um, essential for uh, the further development of the whole ecosystem is the creation of an Irish National Competence Center for Social Innovation, a unique innovation hub who can facilitate cross-sectoral collaboration for social innovation becoming mainstream in Ireland, unlocking public and private funding, unleashing energy, implementing policy across government departments, and allowing international cooperation. Last year, the European Union established uh, a European Competence Center for Social Innovation, which is located in Lithuania at the moment, with the aim of connecting these European competence centers with all the national competence centers for allowing transnational cooperation, peer-to-peer -peer learning. So that will be fundamental. Thank you so much. Uh, that's my presentation. Back to you, Emily. I will stop sharing now my screen. Great. Thank you so much for that, Mario. Um, it sounds like a really exciting initiative to be a part of. And I'm just sort of wondering, so you, you mentioned um, that you're developing kind of capacity building supports for sort of different social innovation actors. And are, so will you be kind of piloting those with kind of community organizations or is there scope for organizations to get involved in that? Well, well as I was saying, um, at the moment we have been just uh, sharing the blueprint that yeah. is talking about the, the 12 key actions and one one key actions that we have been identifying is, is the development of capacity building programs and mm -hmm. capacity building programs i will call it at two layers one layer is capacity building programs for social innovation actors yeah to interact in a better way okay that one but also capacity building programs for social innovators itself okay, okay. and as when we talk about social innovations we know that we have organizations, okay, that can be at different level of maturity or development. So they need different type of capacity building programs. Yeah. Okay. And that is essential to first help them to scale and to maximize their impact. Okay. So that has been one of the recommendations and we're aiming that that will be further developed uh, together with the key members from the, the ecosystem. Great. I look forward to hearing more about that then. Thanks, Mario. Thank you. So we have um, some time left, and I saw that there were a few questions. Um, there was one in the chat. Um, and Jose, I thought maybe you might be able to shed some light on this uh, question here. So Fanula asks, mentioned earlier was a list of potential entities who are eligible to apply for funding. Would it be possible to unpack the opportunities for social enterprises within the arts sector? Or do you have any examples of any kind of social enterprises within the arts sector that have received easy funding? I know I'm putting you on the spot there, but I didn't know if you <laughs> maybe knew of any offhand. Um, well, depend if you're talking about the present, present period of the, the, the previous one. In the previous one, we had the, the financial instruments. Yeah. And there, of course, the, the, there are plenty of examples I don't, I, I don't have in mind uh, right now. Uh, um, but I guess, um, by the way, did you uh, had the, the projects and result report that we publish? Um, then I can send you. You yeah. have it. Yeah, yeah, I can send that on actually in the follow up. Yeah. That's a because good idea. I'm sure, I'm sure there will be. Yeah. And then for whatever has been funded by the EIF under the previous period, you can also find it find it in the in the EIF webpage. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So that's what we'll do then. So in the follow up email, we'll send a list of the project results so people can kind of have a sense. Of what's but now out there. In, in in the present period the, the financing instruments uh, if people don't know they are, they are under um the invest eu fund which is a separate a separate funding program than uh, the sf plus yeah and there where it's there where you will find the, the instruments in fact the, the the loans and the um and the joint ventures to to fund social enterprises you will find them in in the in the employment and social um, protection um, window of the InvestEU fund. Okay, yeah. And, and also, I mean, there are other EU funding programs focused on delivering projects that are arts related, like Creative Europe, and even things like Erasmus Plus might be a good fit for those kinds of projects. So 
Fanula, please feel free to reach out to me directly and we can kind of give you one-to-one -one advice on where your kind of project idea might fit in the wider world of EU funding. <laughs> um, okay, and then there's a question in the Q&A. Uh, Fiona asks, can I please ask what CRM packages services in Ireland use to track and report on engagements in education, training and employment opportunities in Ireland? This is our greatest challenge. Presently, we don't have an adequate system to capture and analyze data. So does anybody on the panel have any kind of insight on that? I mean, we just, we use Salesforce, so I don't know that that's super helpful, but I don't know if Katrina, if there's any kind of software that you guys use in business in the community to kind of track the work that you do with um, kind of job seekers? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, just clarify the question you're looking for a way that it is already tracked across Ireland I I'm, I'm not quite sure that like we internally we would use uh you know Microsoft CRM system and also we use Excel for a lot of our kind of participant tracking that's obviously no use to anybody else <laughs> um I, I'm just not clear of uh what the questioner is looking for Maybe you could repeat the question. Yeah, sure. What CRM packages do services in Ireland use to track and report on engagements in education, training, and employment opportunities in Ireland? Okay. Yeah. It's going just... to be CRM and an Excel sheets. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Classic, <laughs> classic nonprofit way <laughs> to yeah. capture data. Yeah. Mostly Sorry. Excel. <laughs> you know, we don't have any uh, silver bullet for that, unfortunately. I don't know, Jean, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was just going to say that we would track, obviously, uh, activity and placements um, from events um, <clears throat> um, from the live register and other, because it's important to say that uh, our services are for anybody. It doesn't have to be somebody on social welfare payment. It doesn't have to be somebody unemployed it's for anybody across europe can avail of our 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 funding mobility funding and then we would also use our internal systems to track that activity of people who arrive here people who qualify for the um <clears throat> mobility scheme funding uh placements from events and uh you know, we do that in two ways. We do it here internally, and we also do it from the URA's platform, who, when we do online events, they would uh, have automatically built in a lot of stats there in terms of activity, participation, uh, employers, um, feedback from job seekers and employers. So, yeah, again, there's no central point, but uh, it's obviously our department would would have that uh, available as well so it's it's that that would be more in terms of uh jobs and job seekers okay. and the the mobility funding thanks so much jean okay so i don't see any other questions so that means we've all either done our jobs very well or completely overwhelmed everybody with information maybe both um so i guess i will just wrap up now um, by just giving a big thank you to all of the speakers here today. You all gave fabulous presentations um, and thank you so much for giving your time to be here today and to put together those presentations. Um, so I will follow up with everybody uh, that's registered for this event by uh, the end of this week with an email with kind of all the presentations, the links that were mentioned and the recording. So hopefully people will follow up with us directly if they have any more specific questions or need any guidance on navigating these funding opportunities and different initiatives. Um, so yeah, again, thanks so much to everybody for coming out today. Hope to see some of you at the Building Your EU Partnership training at 2 o'clock p.m. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Emily. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.